So welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Elena Beaver. Um, I'm the Universal Instructional Design Consultant in the Office of Information Technology at CU Boulder. And I'm going to talk with you a little bit about universal design and making accessible materials in your class and teaching with accessible materials. So we're going to have a portion of this session that's going to get a little hands-on at the end. So if you have a digital device with you, you can actually play with some of the tools that we're talking about. Um, and if you don't have a personal device, then you're welcome to just sit next to a partner or something and just play around with this stuff a little bit. Um, so a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. I'd like to give you all a little bit of a background about um, the Department of, In Department of Justice inquiry that happened at CU Boulder, just so that you kind of understand from our perspective um, what's been happening the past two years on our campus and why we're so focused on accessibility now. Um, and what the implications are going to be for the entire system, meaning your respective campuses as well. Um, and as well, I'm going to touch on our new accessibility policy. There's information about that policy um, so that you have it as some context on the handout that's come around. If you don't have this handout, raise your hand and we'll get you an extra copy. There should be some extras that ended up back there. Thank you, Kate. Um, we're going to talk about, very briefly, the theory of universal design. I know that there's a course here that many of you may have already taken about universal design, so we're just going to touch on it very, very briefly so that you have a quick refresher about um, universal design in general and what the seven principles entail. And then we're going to start right into application of that theory. So we're going to look at a real-world example that then I think will serve as a nice jumping-off point for looking at accessible materials. We're going to uh, dig into our hands-on activity, talk about some resources, and then I'll be answering any questions that you might have. Okay, so um, about two years ago, the CU Boulder campus received an inquiry from the Department of Justice on behalf of students with blindness or low vision at our campus um, who found um, rampant inaccessibility. <laughs> uh, these are students who, you know, disability status is not something that's known on an application. These students are by, by right, you know, allowed to have access, equal access to everything that they should be able to access as a student of the university. However, um, there were problems with our digital technologies, specifically our portals. Um, students weren't able to log in and register for classes on their own if they were blind. They weren't able to check their grades. They couldn't pay their bill. They couldn't make an appointment with an advisor. Um, these are pretty egregious differences um, and inequalities when it comes to what our students with blindness and low vision had access to. So they filed the inquiry. Um, it also listed some physical changes, but for the most part, the physical accessibility of the campus wasn't so much an issue. It was when digital technology was becoming part of the physical campus. So I don't know about your buildings, but a lot of our newer buildings have these beautiful flat screen TVs that have become digital signage. So you walk in and you know it'll show you the floor plan of the building or a map or um, sometimes it'll have announcements or information. Um, if you walk up and touch one of these screens, it has no ability to tell you out loud what it says. So it's basically worthless. And in buildings that it's taken the place of a physical person who used to be there to answer questions, that's where it was getting to become a big problem. So. Um, as with any national inquiry that threatens to become a lawsuit against an R1 institution, you can bet that the chancellor had uh, the attention, right, of, of the Department of Justice, right? Um, so from the chancellor on down, things started to happen in lightning speed on institutional time. Within 18 months, there were a bunch of changes that occurred, um, and we successfully avoided the lawsuit. So the inquiry um, was dropped after we provided copious documentation, um, the Department of Justice turns out isn't a good pen pal. You send them information once a month, letting them know what the status is, what we're doing, the new hires, the things that are being put in place. And eventually they just said, okay, you're good, steady as she goes. And they rescinded the inquiry. So we see that as a huge win. Um, they could come back. Uh, so, you know, it's we see it as um, something that we're on the right track and now we need to follow through or they will come back and certainly ding us again in the future. So therefore the stuff that's already in place we intend to keep going with and um, expand on. Um, 
one of the things that has happened is that we have an ICT, uh, Information and Communications Technologies Accessibility Initiative. Um, so Dan Jones was named our Chief Digital Accessibility Officer. He uh, also works for security at the system level. And because of his system level role, there are some changes that are impacting um, accessibility on the Boulder campus that are set to become changes for the entire institution. One of those, for example, is within the next few months, you'll see a, a Skillsoft course. So like when you're hired, you have to take the discrimination and harassment training that's online or the securities training that's online. There will be one of those about accessibility now um, that every employee basically on you know, the CU Boulder system uh, will take that course. So it's something that very slowly, these things are going to be important um, university-wide across campuses. So that's why it's wonderful that you are in this room and learning about this stuff, and you'll be on the, the cutting edge. So when people in your department have questions, you can be somebody who can answer those questions, which is fantastic. So um, that's what's going on there. Um, on my campus, I am the faculty and staff-facing resource. Um, as a member of OIT. OIT on our campus is taking on a new role of uh, sort of the vanguards of accessibility. Now whenever there's an accessibility question at Boulder, you call 5HELP, you do help at colorado.edu, and it gets you to um, the OIT system where we're tracking everything from, you know, physical accessibility issues, a lock is broken on a wheelchair accessible bathroom stall. We will take that ticket and route it to facilities management. A student who is blind is visiting campus and they need additional support during their visit. We will take that ticket and route it to Disability Services or to the ADA Coordinator's Office. Um, so we're tracking all of this stuff centrally, um, which is wonderful because now we have a much um, broader picture of what's going on in terms of accessibility on our campus. Okay, so when students enter the university, they come with all sorts of inspiration and goals. They have all of these dreams. Um, and the important thing to note about our students is that we don't know whether or not they have disabilities. Disability status is something that's prote protected by FERPA. And um, you can't ask if a student has a disability or not. Um, so uh, that's something that's important to, to note on our campus, something that's new this semester is that if you have a student that's registered with Disability Services, there's alert, an alert now at the top of the roster that says you have two students in your course who um, require a print accommodation, or you have one student in your course who uh, is entitled to extended time on exams. So it lists the accommodations at the top of your roster now. So we are seeing a lot of changes. I don't think you guys are doing that yet. It's I don't believe it's a... a Denver thing or an Aurora campus thing. Um, the students have to tell us. Yeah, they students do. still are on the old model. Like the they board. present, yeah, they present to you. But now on Boulder's campus, it's raising the, the consciousness of the faculty even more because now, before students were completely hidden. Now faculty have a little bit of an inkling and they can prepare a little bit more to welcome those students into their courses. Um, are there plans to have that? Maybe. I am not the best one to answer that particular question. But um, it's actually been really cool. It's been something that has helped people um, find out more information from disability services. They won't tell you who your student is, but they will tell you, has this student used these accommodations in the past, and whether or not they're likely to in your course. Um, so it just helps you as, as the faculty member be more prepared as you move into the semester. Um, it's also created a lot of new interest in issues around accessibility and um, conversations around inclusive excellence. And on our campus, inclusive excellence, capital I, capital E, is a new um, focus from our chancellor. So our chancellor has now named inclusivity as something that's really important, and our accessibility policy kind of falls under that umbrella. So from the chancellor on down, this is where it's coming from, which is really cool. It's really neat to see this sort of um, top-down effort. Um, so, the good news is that <laughs> inclusivity is not hard to achieve, and universal design just feels like good teaching, so we'll get there in a moment. But where I'm going with this slide is the idea that disability is a social construct. 
So um, most of the students on the CU Boulder campus have uh, learning disabilities of one type or another. Some students, if they're blind or if they um, are hard of hearing or deaf and they require, you know, physical real-time accommodations, um, they're out already. We know if a student has a physical impairment when they come in the door in a wheelchair. Um, but the vast majority of students who need the support that we're going to be talking about today are students that have some sort of learning impairment, meaning they need to hear the uh, text as they're reading it, perhaps. So that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. Students with dyslexia, students with extreme ADHD, students with traumatic brain injury, um, other processing disorders. It's, it's a really broad category. Um, but you, you won't know who that student is, and they may never present. They may present their letter halfway through the term. And so then you accommodate them from then that point forward. You don't retroactively accommodate, ever. Um, it's the student's responsibility. We also know, though, that for every four students, this is a national statistic, for every four students that receive IEP support in high school for an intellectual disability of one kind or another, only a quarter of those students that go to college choose to self-identify and register with the Disability Services Office. And that's due to a variety of personal, complex, social issues, right? Students may not want to out themselves among their friends as the dyslexic one. Um, if they can help it. You know, it, it's really complicated for the same reason that, you know, when you join the workforce, you may not want to tell your supervisor what your learning impairment might be if you have one. Um, so it's all about how people self-identify and it's about how people learn best. And for the most part, people figure things out. People are smart. You'll figure out what works for you. A lot of students who have learning impairment have um, a certain type of screen reader so that they can use their mouse and hover over text and it will read it out loud to them. And that's a, a, a really good tool to help students who need dual input have that input. Other students with blindness or low visit, vision require a screen reader that reads everything on the computer out loud to them. Um, so screen reader sometimes gets a little fuzzy which kind of tool people mean. But um, in general, if we're talking about accessibility, digital accessibility, it means the computer can read it out loud. So that as we're moving forward here, and it's kind of on the back of the sheet. Um, but that's what we're talking about. So if something's accessible, it means a computer can read it out loud, and you would still be able to absorb the full content of that information um, in an equitable way. Um, but yeah, uh, so just keep in mind, we're talking about diversity here and levels of ability. I try to get away from the disability negative tone um, because it really is a matter of perception, and several of you in this room, like me, use assistive technology every single day, right? <laughs> and it's just a matter of how you look at it. Um, okay, so what is universal design? I hope many of you in this room already know that universal design is a theoretical framework for all learners. The idea is to proactively design so that everybody is included from the start. We're designing for a broad range of characteristics, from students who may need assistive technology because they have blindness or low vision, um, to students who have a learning disability, to students um, who have deafness or hard of hearing. You can put materials together in such a way that all of those students will succeed equally well. Um, and it's, for the most part, not very hard. It's just a little bit of mindfulness. And so I'm going to show you some tips and tricks in a couple of platforms that we use a lot. Um, Microsoft Word Office, Docs, and uh, and PowerPoint so that that way you know it's kind of like a consciousness raising you, once you know what the buttons do you're like oh I wonder why I never did that before I guess I just didn't know what they were for <laughs> now you'll know <laughs> um, so there's seven principles of universal design again they're on the handout I'm not going to go too far into this I'm going to assume that you kind of are familiar with this on your own um, we're going to skip straight to ap applied examples of this in the real world because I think that's where it starts to make more sense and really click for a lot of people. The thing that I really want to mention about the seven principles is that you don't have to have all seven for something to be universally designed. These are guidelines. So if you're designing an, a completely online course, number seven is about physical spaces in the real world. That may not apply at all because <laughs> you're designing an online space that's to be accessed from a variety of different places. So universal design is contextually bound. It's, 
these are ways to help you think about what makes sense given the situation that you're in. It's not a hard and fast rule. Um, and it's also truly scholarship, so you know, lots of people have used universal design across different disciplines. So if you're interested, do some Google searching or go to the resources on the handout and find out more about it. Um, okay, so this is a door that I like to show a lot. This is a picture of a door that exhibits uh, examples of universal design. Um, personally, it's one of my favorite doors on campus because it's a portal to coffee, and it's also the door to the, the library, so it's a portal to books. Two of my favorite things. I use this door a lot. <laughs> um, but there are some lovely features of this door that make it accessible to a maximum number of people. Um, what are some things that you're noticing right away? Just shout it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's handles. extra wide. Uh huh. The handle shape is easily graspable. You could do that with a cane as well as your hand. You yeah, yeah. You can push the button on the side, and the doors will open automatically. Things are where you expect them. Mm hmm. Yeah. Slid up. Mm hmm. Yep, yep. It'll be easily seen at night if you're approaching this doorway. Keep it's a. Line. Yeah, yeah. Um. Smooth approach, so you're not climbing any stairs to get there. Right. Um, wider than standard door width means a person in a wheelchair is not scraping their knuckles on the door frame just to get inside. Taller than standard door frame, I know it's kind of hard to tell with the scale of this picture, but it is a taller than standard door, so you could be a robust, healthy person carrying a tall, awkward plant into the library or whatever it is and still get through the door just fine. Um, lower than standard handle placement, um, if somebody needs that, then it's lower down. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of things that are sort of just invisible features of this architecture that actually are conscious choices that have made this door accessible to a maximum number of users. Now, it's not absolutely perfect. If it were perfect, maybe this button would be over here. What that tells me when I see stuff like this in architecture, that tells me that um, Maybe it was going to cost an extra $1,000 to run the cable through the concrete and up to the other side. So whenever there's things like that that do happen, that tells me somebody was cutting a quarter because of a budget constraint. But in general, it has all of these features that are here and that are present and that make this door really user-friendly, unlike some other portals on our campus. Right. So not to pick on any one particular building, but... Um, this is a, a door to the chemistry building, and um, it is right off of sort of a, a open area on our campus where there's a fountain. Students congregate in this area a lot. Students are up and down and in and out of this building a lot. They actually cut through it to the other side. You can see that it goes sort of straight through. They cut through it so that it's a shortcut to the library. <laughs> so they like use the building as like a tunnel practically. Um, so this particular door gets a lot of use and on our campus it gets a lot of chuckles when I see when I show this slide because people are very familiar with this door. Yeah it's gonna let you know that that if you are using wheels to enter the building that you can enter this building it may cause you to circumnavigate the entire thing and get lost and then maybe have to struggle going up the ramp that hasn't been shoveled um, so that you can get inside. So it's certainly not um, a, a universally designed um, model for this building. Um, but even things that aren't particularly conscious, yes, there are stairs, but technically more than three stairs, and you should have a handrail, because that's building code. Um, so even things like that. You mean the plant wasn't there? I know, right? <laughs> you couldn't just lean into the, those prickly bushes and get some help there? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, it's stuff like that that, that is, you know, when we're so used to being able-bodied in a physical environment, we don't even think about it. But I had a baby last year, and trying to traverse campus pushing a stroller, I gained a whole new appreci appreciation for just how challenging it is to actually get around and not use stairs. Um, so, you know, it's stuff like that, that, um, that we easily take for granted. Um, so, okay, so that's universal design in the physical world. You'll, you probably will notice it, like, all over the place when you, you know, are walking around, going in and out of shops or, you know, driving around town. Um, 
because fortunately architecture has done a good job of catching up. That's where the, the theory originated, was in architecture. If we use it for education, it becomes more of a metaphor. Um, so if we're now thinking of your course as a door, it's the portal to their education, it welcomes them into their learning uh, for the rest of the, their life, you know, whatever extended metaphor you want to use, um, it becomes a really apt thing because sometimes people say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm designing this course and I have the books listed and I have my handouts and my things. And, well, everybody has access to that. I've given everyone the same key to the door. So it's equal, right? No problems. It's equal. Everybody has the same key. If they can't get to the door, the key is worthless. <laughs> they can't walk in. So that's why it's important to be thinking about universal design from a place of providing equity rather than equality. Isn't that a fun slide? I just one of my favorites, because um, it just immediately kind of, ah, we get it, yes. Um, so we're at this place of equity, we're rallied, we're, we're on board, we're going to make some accessible stuff, um, because the last thing we want to do is, you know, just unconsciously keep producing inaccessible materials if we know better. So um, let's make these ideas happen. Uh, at the end of this, here's what I want you to come away with. So knowing why accessibility is important at CU, how the Boulder experience is a cautionary tale for the other campuses, and you're going to do better than us and be better and start applying some of these things proactively. Um, talking about universal design and accessibility, I guarantee you your colleagues are not thinking about this. So if you're the one to bring it up at the next meeting, awesome. Um, know some basics when producing materials, that's what you're going to get today. And if you have questions, it's the digital age. First, start by YouTubing it or Googling it. There's a lot of good stuff that you can find just online. Um, and, you know, if you have questions, uh, yes, I'm in Boulder, but you'll have my contact info. You can reach out to me, that's okay. Um, and find your local advocates. Talk to Kate, talk to other people on your respective um, campuses or departments that can help you with this kind of stuff because it's not magic it's mindfulness um, and another thing I wanted to mention if you end up do making some new things so Boulder's plan is to become a fully accessible campus by fiscal year 2018 the way that we're positioning this with our faculty is focus on everything that's new after this and you know how to create some accessible stuff don't think, oh my gosh, every Word document I've ever done is wrong. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and remediate everything. Um, no, don't cancel your weekend plans. This is not intended to make your life miserable. Chances are what you have is going to work just fine for now. Um, students will let you know if you need to remediate something immediately. Uh, and you can handle that at that point. But as you move forward, and you're making something new, reformatting your, your syllabus for next time, um, redoing a handout for a new assignment that you create and just part of your course, whatever it is, do those accessibly. And unless you have something beautiful that you just made that you intend to be teaching with for five years, by 2018, a lot of your stuff is maybe going to change a little bit here and there. Um, so slowly remediate things, change things as you go. So that's the message that we're telling people at Boulder. And you can kind of think of it the same way. Um, just the next time that you go to make a PowerPoint or go to make a, a Word document, um, try out some of this stuff and, and save it and go from there. Um, that's how, you know, this stuff will really become part of your, your practice in your teaching and in your work so that it's not overwhelming or it's not making you miserable. So that's not the intent. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about accessible Word documents and also Google Docs. Does anybody use Google Docs a lot here? <laughs> All right. Um, so I might not talk about it that much, just a little bit for you guys, um, since the majority of our attendees don't really use Google Docs a whole lot in their teaching. So that's totally fine. Um, so the main thing to remember in using a Google Doc is to use a style sheet or a design theme. It depends on your version of Word and what it's called. Um, between PCs and Macs, sometimes these 
buttons are located in different places. So if when we're doing the hands-on portion of this, if you're like, I can't find these buttons anywhere. Where is the style sheet? Um, raise your hand and I'll come help you troubleshoot and find it. Because uh, sometimes just depending on your version or depending on your machine, it won't look exactly like the screenshot I'm about to show you. And that's okay. It just means that it's at a, a different place. So let's say you have a document and you've typed up your content. And now you want to go back and make it look pretty. You want to make this look like an agenda of some kind. Um, so you're going to change the title so that it looks like the title of the document. Um, how would you do this, typically? Walk me through your process. Yeah. Yeah, so you'd select the text. You'd highlight the word title, maybe center it. What else might you do? Bold. Bold. Increase the font size. Increase the font size, yeah. Maybe change the font color. It depends on what this is for, yeah. right? But you might change the font color, and then you might change the font. And then you spacing might before. Mm -hmm, change the spacing before or after the title. Um, yeah. That's what we're moving towards, yes. So, yeah. So rather than highlighting one element of your document and going through, before you know it, like a dozen separate, discrete, eye-hand coordinated movements, thinking about how to format this one one tiny element of your document, right? Um, you've spent a lot of time. That's a lot of cognitive load. <laughs> you've just been playing around with that thing. Um, you could just put your cursor next to the word title or in the word title. You don't even have to select the whole thing. And just come over here and click title and bam. So you go through and you just put your cursor next to the things that are supposed to look like things and select the appropriate buckets of where things go, and it will automatically format it for you. So the styles pane is what this is called, um, and it's very, very cool because it does things instantly and automatically. You can customize this so that it will do automatic APA formatting for you, for example. I have friends who, you know, know their preferred journal whenever they're writing something, they want to automatically format it so that they can submit it to that publisher without having to change a thing. And then within shortcut keys, because all of this has associated shortcut keys, they can just, as they're typing it, format the document. It's beautiful. I know. I'm nice seeing your eyeballs. Thing. Yeah, I know. Oh, it's awesome. One. So you can, yeah, so you can create templates and save them and open up that template every single time and rename it as your document and then just go. And it's super cool. It's fast, it's efficient, and the biggest thing to remember in terms of this session is that it creates a very usable, accessible experience for somebody using a screen reader. So Microsoft Word is accessible um, for people who use screen readers, and I'm talking about blind students, students who have to listen for everything in their lives. Um, when they open up their computer, it speaks to them everything from, you know, like, hello, now you are on the internet browser, now you are on Microsoft Word, right? And it will begin reading out loud everything. Um, using styles, uh, the analogy that I like to use is, uh, let's say you're reading a book on a Kindle. Anybody read a book on a Kindle, an e-reader? You know how these things work. Um, let's say you're up to chapter five, and then you bumped your Kindle or, you know, closed out the program or something, and it forgot where you were. So the next time you open it up, you're back at the beginning. If you, um, and you know that for that Kindle book, you can just click back to chapter five. You can go to the table of contents, click chapter five, or skip ahead by chapter. And within like four or five clicks, you're back where you were. You're enjoying your book. That's because the computer has the chapter headings tagged. And it can skip within a quick click to the right place. Awesome. Good user experience, readers happy. That's what you want. Um, if a student who's blind doesn't have any of this kind of tagging, it's like that Kindle book without chapters. So you left off at chapter five, you're pushing the next button a hundred times to look at every single page you've already read so that you can get back to chapter five. Terrible user experience, it's exhausting. So can you read it? Yes. Do you want to have to do that? No. So that's why um, 
if this is your syllabus, and let's say it's a long syllabus, you have a lot of info in there, it's 12 pages long, and the schedule's at the end of the syllabus. The student wants to know what's due next Thursday. If it has headings, and if it's tagged like this, they know that they can skip from course information as a heading one, it's a big bucket, to um, materials for the course, heading one, it's a big bucket, to, you know, grading scheme, it's a big bucket, also a heading one. Maybe within grading scheme, you have a couple of other things that are tagged, heading two, heading three, right? So it's not that every single heading is a new number, it's you're going by the buckets of the big, 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 with sub buckets in. You're creating an outline, right? Um, I'll, I'll get you in just a second. Um, so that way, within a few clicks, they can jump by headings to where it says course schedule and zip into the course schedule and find out what's due next Thursday rather than having to start with course XYZ, instructor information, you know, and have the entire syllabus read out loud to them before they can hear what's due next Thursday. So that's why it's super important to just build this into your workflow because it ends up making your documents more beautiful, it will save you time, and it will make it fully accessible for all students. This presumes we're doing everything in Word and just uploading Word pages. What the can, how the Canvas system works? I mean, Canvas will automatically fill, fill in all our, our work, all, our, all the assignments or all the stuff into our syllabus. We would have to do all of that manually to get it into Word. And, and any changes would have to be done in Canvas and in the syllabus. And I mean, you can tag headings and things like that within your in the within rich text, text editor. editor. Yeah, the rich text editor and all the headings. Yeah, because we're we're talking about the heading structure here. So if you're tagging headings as you're creating content in Canvas, CU Boulder is using Desire to Learn, which I wish we were on Canvas. We're not. Canvas is more accessible. Desire to Learn is also accessible, but they don't have built-in headings. So I had to create an HTML template, and I have to show people how to upload the template and then use it every time they create something new so that they have those headings and can, can select these heading levels. For Canvas, it sounds like it's already built in, which is great. So when you download to a Word document from your Canvas content, it will remember these, and it will preserve those tags. Um, but if you're creating something in Word to be using these as well, it's very, very helpful. That way when you upload into Canvas, it should remember all of those tags too. When you create PDFs, it will remember the heading structure. Yeah. So that's why it's super important. When you create PDFs from Word documents or download into PDF, um, the best way to find out if that PDF is readable by a computer, again, that's sort of our definition, our working definition of functional accessibility. Can a computer read it out loud? If you aren't sure, click into the PDF. If you can highlight an individual word or a sentence or something, um, or search within the PDF, uh, it's accessible. It's going to be fine, um, at least on a functional basis. Your, your images may not be tagged properly. Your, you know, equations or things may not read properly, but for majority of students who have just some sort of uh, intellectual cognitive um, impairment that they need that dual display, that's good enough for most of those students. If you have a student with blindness, then they're going to need that in a, probably a Word document anyway. So that's something your disability <coughs> services office will support them with. Um, so we're not talking necessarily about that, but just for functional accessibility, if you can click and highlight stuff in that PDF, you're good to go. If you can't, if it's been something you've scanned um, off of, you know, a book, um, and it just lights up yellow, you click in there, you can't highlight a single thing, it just all lights up, it's read as an image file. So that is going to need some remediation. Something that I've gotten into the habit of doing is sometimes when I find those chapters, sometimes I'll just Google the chapter or Google like a really unique sentence out of the, the chapter, and um, oftentimes I'll find somebody else has already put a PDF of it on the internet that I can just download that is accessible. Um, the internet's an amazing place. Sometimes that's the case. Which you could be violating copyright laws. <laughs> um, it's, it's unlikely if something is available in that form, um, but... You can get in a general, for you too, so yeah, you, you certainly, yeah, 
I forgot the word. OCR. Yeah, exactly. The optical character recognition software will right. do that. Oh, a lot of good scanners yeah. now, modern scanners, if they, if they have the right plugins available, and this is something you can ask your administrative assistants for support with, will do an optical character recognition as you, as you scan it from the book. As it's creating that initial digital PDF, it will do optical character recognition and make it accessible. So hopefully that's the case How in the department. Or um, LaTeX is, um, yeah, they often are accessible in special cases. So that's sort of another conversation. So we can talk more about that at the end. But yeah, there are ways to make all of that accessible. Chances are um, students who really need that know that they can get, go to disability services and they have a much more robust optical character recognition software that can make sure that all of that is reading properly. Yeah, because most over-the-counter stuff or free stuff is hard to access. Um, CU Boulder just recently contracted with a, a company called Census Access that is a pretty robust OCR engine and it will create more accessible versions and it will also create like from Word to PDF or It'll even save things as like a digital braille file if you want. <laughs> Not that anybody needs to be responsible for creating braille files. That's in the realm of accommodation. You never have to worry about braille. That's a very specific language for a specific subset of pe pe people. So that's not universal design. So don't think that like, oh no, I have a blind student. How do I have to get a hold of a braille copy of my text? No, you would never have to worry about that. And most blind students, want a digital copy so that they can hear it read out loud. Braille is very, very specific, and it's usually for students who are mathematicians who need to actually be able to feel the characters and go back and forth and really absorb the equation. That's pretty much all that our blind students use it for anyway. So um, very specific combination. Yeah? Just real quickly, uh -huh. I like what you said about just changing new things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to freak out and change everything. Exactly. But I tried into this very slowly a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and, and I found later on that it gave me all sorts of other benefits, which is another conversation, but when you do other complex things like making a table of contents yes. and so forth, then you can do it. Yeah. And so you don't have to change everything now, but you just sort of put your toe in the water, and later exactly. you might realize it. Yes. Thank you. I, I want to like get you on on you know some sort of record for for being a, a faculty testimony uh, of like <laughs> <laughs> yes it it makes life better yes it, but yeah, it's it's, it's important yeah. yeah yeah a little at a time and exactly table of contents super easy to generate um, when you have things properly tagged so um, so yeah um, so that's what we're looking at here you can change the look and feel of things with the design theme you can change all those headers. In Google Docs, you can find the headings and apply them with shortcut keys. There's just not all of these preset themes. In Word, there's tons of themes here that will open up, and you can change the whole look and feel of the document just by clicking different stuff. And you can customize. Yeah, and you can <laughs> customize and create your own, which is fantastic. That's really what I recommend. Whenever Word, Microsoft Word creates pre-done stuff for you, it's probably going to be a little ugly, so. <laughs> um, which we'll talk about here in a second when we look at PowerPoint. So, But yeah, so they just don't have the pre-done version. There's only like one, and then Google's like, ah, heck, just go and customize. <laughs> so, But it still exists. Um, so yeah, that's important to know. So PowerPoint, use the layouts. We're going to check the outline view of a PowerPoint to see if things are accessible. Um, if it's not showing up in the outline view, it can't be read by a screen reader user. So it's not accessible. So what that means is if you are the kind of person that loves to use the insert text box tool, I know we're guilty of it, those, that text is read like an image. It's not read like text at all. So I'm going to show you here what I mean by that, what that looks like. So let's say somebody has emailed a PowerPoint to you. The first thing people do typically is open it up and just glance up and down the side, get a sense of what the slides look like. Blind users do the same thing, except in order to do that, they go to View, and then they go to Outline View. And this is all the stuff that will read out loud to them. They can't see the images, so they need to have content that will hopefully explain the images and let them know. Now, 
my recommendations are a little bit different than what you might find on a PowerPoint forum or if you go on to lynda.com or YouTube or whatever and search accessible PowerPoint, they'll recommend that you, you know, click on this and add alt text. And they'll recommend that you consistently use the notes because you can use the notes and screen reader users can navigate to that content. It's just really clunky. We have an accessibility and usability lab at CU Boulder. Brand new thing, again, exciting changes. Woo. Um, but I have a colleague who's blind, and I work with her a lot on materials that I present with. And I said, you know, hey, what do you think of this version? I, I did everything accessibly. And she was like, well, here's what I see to be the problems with it. When I put it in outline view, it, like there's whole slides that are blank. And I'm like, but it's all tagged. And she's like, yeah, but I, I see that out of order. She's like, what I do is I will highlight all of that, copy paste it into a Word doc and fly through it with my screen reader to get an overview of what's the content in that presentation. Things that show up as blank slides, I try to make a mental note that, you know, slide three is blank. Maybe there's an image there, maybe there's not. I guess I'll have to go out into PowerPoint, tab and, you know, very laboriously tab and through every single thing. And by every single thing, it's like, this text box is announced, this text box is announced, then the background image is announced, then this is announced, then she can go to the next slide. It's very time intensive to just do that and create a mental map of where you are and what you're listening for. I mean, it's just kind of exhausting. Um, so if she does get to that info, if it's there, it's all out of order. She's like, after the first three slides that are just blank, I'm assuming you're not alt tagging anything. Or I'm assuming that you don't have notes in the notes section. So I'm going to stop looking. So if you, if on slide, you know, 28, you have a really long paragraph of alt text to describe a really important table upon which the entire presentation hinges, I'm never going to get to that content because you've taught me, because through the lack of consistency in your presentation, that there's nothing important here. You just don't know anything about accessibility. Ah, so now we come to how do we hack this to make it usable, right? Yeah. So is this why we have a blind student who says she can't read PowerPoints? Is this is she just, just assuming that we don't know enough to? Mostly, yeah. Because okay. she yeah. said, yeah, I don't want to see anything in PowerPoints. And... Yeah, that's because a lot of students, like, they get this, you know, where it's like a couple of random bullet pointed things and then there's a lot of images or, or the entire thing is blank because the instructor just used text boxes to create the whole thing. So Even if you do have a lot of images, how do you get those to a student who... I'll talk with you a little bit about that. I'm going to show you in this example kind of my, the way that I do it anyway. And for me, it's made me a better presenter, and it's very minimal amount of time, actually, I find. Um, so let's say on this text, on this slide, I wanted to add some text. And so now there's text on this slide. You present, and it looks like this. Woo. Um, but I use the Insert Text Box tool. It's there, right? Because when we present, it looks like this. You can see it. But because I inserted the text box, slide three, there's nothing. It's still a blank slide. So that's what I mean, that those text boxes don't work. You need to put all of this in here if it's going to show up in that outline view. Um, and the different layouts and stuff, uh, that's what we need. You can change these, these. You can add more. You can create new ones. So if you're like, but I need 17 text boxes in my slide, cool. You just do an extra step to create a new layout with 17 text boxes. And then you've saved it, and you can reuse that same layout whenever you want in your presentation. But it may not be there. You almost never want to use the blank one. That's just kind of silly and worthless. Um, so that's, that's sort of the issue there. Um, I may have taken out my slide about images, yeah, because um, I wanted some time for us to play around with things. So I took out that slide specifically about alt tagging images. I can use an example from this, perhaps. Can I Bye. ask a question about yeah. Canvas now that mm -hmm. you mentioned the alt tags? I, it doesn't, when you're adding an image, it doesn't give you an option of alt tagging it, does it? So it, it like alt tags. Mm -hmm. So when I'm using images, 
looks to me like it says the aspect ratio will be maintained, but I don't see like a box that says put your all print. I think it depends on how you add it. There's that tree icon in the toolbar. Yeah. Where's the layout? And it brings up the uh, so On PowerPoint, yeah. it would be. You'd have to click back to the home. This is in the view. So you'd have to click home. And then at least in this version of Word, it was kind of in that bar that you would get to lay out. I have a sample PowerPoint that I'm going to pull up here in a second, and we'll take a look um, and see. But uh, just really quickly, if I'm working with images, what I typically do is whatever I want somebody to know, because this is a screenshot. There's no text on this. It will come up blank if I don't put something here. Um, I usually write in the notes what I want a blind user to be able to see. I want them to know that it's a screenshot of a PowerPoint presentation showing the outline view where the user can see the text on slides that will be viewable to a screen reader shown for demonstration purposes. So they don't really need to know which slide it is, what I've circled. They need to know the gist of what's going on here. So I copy paste that and I repeat it on here. And again, this is a little meta because so ignore this, but this is this is this box. This big box that would be this content is down here. I copy pasted it and I dragged it off the slide. So when I'm presenting, that text isn't there. But when it's in the outline view, the student can read it because it made it into the presentation. So just put stuff in a text box that is part of the layout view and drag it off the slide. Your sighted viewer will almost never even know that this is here. They'll go through and they'll just see the slides and they'll see the notes and they'll be like, all right, cool, you know? No, the side of you would get the benefit too. Yeah. When they're looking at the outline view. Right, if they were to, exactly, if they were to ever go to oh, the outline view. Oh, that was that picture. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If they were to ever go to the outline view, the majority of students that I've talked to don't even know the outline view exists. It'd be a great opportunity in your course to let them know that the outline view is there because it's a great review tool in my opinion. It's a great study guide. What I do with my presentations at the beginning of every presentation I do now I have a little accessibility note that lets a, a non-sighted viewer know that everything they're going to need to get my presentation is in the outline view. That I explain all images and that I put any notes that would be pertinent in the outline view so that that's all they need so that they can understand what's going on and follow along so if I had a blind person in the room today I would have made sure they had this presentation ahead of time and they'd be following along with an earbud as I switch from slide to slide I would probably just call out I'm on slide three advanced slide and they would hear all of that outline view text read in their ear and they'd also just be hearing what you're hearing um, but that's how a non-sighted viewer would experience accessible PowerPoint. Um, so yeah, that's my recommendation. But you guys had no idea that this slide was here, because when I present, I just start from slide two. And it doesn't really matter. Sighted viewers, maybe it raises their consciousness a little bit to see this. But for the most part, they're like, all right, whatever. <laughs> they just go on and use the PowerPoint for what they need it for. So um, that's my hack based on my experience with a blind colleague of how to make PowerPoint most useful of how to be designing PowerPoint. Um, so that's that and I can answer any other questions about PowerPoint in particular but with our last 10 minutes I was going to suggest that we take a little bit of an opportunity for you all to play with some materials. So these are very basic things. Bitlinks are case sensitive, so as you type this in and go to this, um, it'll take you to a Google Doc, um, and you can just download this info. Um, honestly, since we're short on time, if you feel that you get the Word doc things, let's start with the PowerPoint. If you have PowerPoint on your machine, we can open up PowerPoint and go from there. So it's Bitlink CU Accessible Materials. And you should see this, basically. So go ahead and download Media Fun Club. Mm -hmm. And go ahead and actually download it so that it downloads rather than. Um, the link is 
CU Accessible Materials, capital A, capital M. All one word, because bitlinks are case sensitive. And it'll bring you here, and just make sure that you actually download it instead of trying to do it here. This is Google Drive's display. That, that's not going to be useful for you. Um, I promise I'm not giving your computer a virus, Alex. Okay. How is this file? It's small. It's four slides. It should be pretty small. I don't know. So I, I may have to come and take a look. Um, but yeah, as we go through, you know, on these different slides, you can look at what's the layout of this slide, right? You can see if it's in the view and what the outline view is. Um, oh, this is, I opened up a new one somehow. The view and then the outline view. This is what would be read out loud. So you can see slide two has some problems. And it's because I use text boxes to draw each of these things. More or less, it might look the same as this, but it's not. You can also see that there are numbers down the sides here. That's the order of the, this text box layout, the order that it's going to read things out loud. So you can always move these text boxes wherever you want on the slide. But just know that the, the blind user is still going to read it in this order. So it's just something, again, to be mindful of as you're designing stuff. So the, the goal here was to just let you play around with stuff and make sure that you could get to these views on your machine and know what's going on with them. And then if we wanted to, you could try to you know come up with a good way of describing an image and putting this here and then dragging the text box off so that it's not displayed. Um, so yeah, if you have some time and want to work with that, you can. Uh, also happy to answer any questions that you might have at this point or demonstrate anything else that you're still having um, questions about.